What is up everybody? Coach Ken from Giving It A Try. And here we are. Already, you know, it feels like yesterday I announced uh, the race of Jones Beach 70.3. Uh, that's already a couple years ago. And here we are. We've now passed this event twice. It's the day after 2024. We all remember Jones Beach, the inaugural race in 2023. Uh, here on Long Island, and it was, you know, set up to be a, a really awesome, fast course. As being a Long Island native and being part of a big group of triathletes locally to the race, it was pretty awesome to see that event come to such a local place, the training ground that we, we have. I mean, where we train is literally out of that parking lot where transition is a lot of the time. But we all remember 2023, the hurricane that came through, and the shortened swim, we were able to have a triathlon at least that day. But it felt like a lot of redemption there for a lot of athletes. And it was one of those like, well, if that was the weather and what we had in 2023, there's no possible way. Well, A, that it could be worse. So we've already endured maybe the worst that we could have on a race day like this. And uh, surely it's got to be better than that. Uh, you know, leading... Into this, we'll talk about how the weather patterns trended up until race day being local and, uh, you know, let you know how it went, you know, the four months leading up to it. But let's talk real quick, Jones Beach 70.3 course in general. Uh, you know, it is a fast, flat course. It's meant to probably have some really good times. The swim is in Zach's Bay, 1.2 miles uh, in a protected bay. So really, you're not really going to have much current or anything to deal with. Most days... It's flat. It's like a pancake, you know, low winds down there. Even on windy days, you know, you're not going to see chop. You're not going to see white caps. You're not going to see anything of that sort there whenever you pass by it in the early mornings. And then you'll have transition, which is literally right there. It's like the shortest transition you can have in a race. You come out of the swim, you it's right there. You're in it. And uh, then you're out. You're out on a fast 56 mile two loop bike course. And I can't reiterate the importance of this, of having a closed bike course. We all know the courses, these flat and fast courses, where they give you one lane of a highway or an expressway. But this is literally a parkway on Long Island where you're getting three lanes in each direction. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into the bike segment recap. And then you come back into transition again real quick. And then you're out onto the run course, which is a fast, flat boardwalk run and it's promised to really try and give you some awesome times, some PR. I mean, the only thing maybe on good weather days, this could be like a hot run because there's really no shade or anything like that. It's kind of reminiscent of that Atlantic City race where you're out on a parkway. Uh, you know, you come back in off that expressway and you run out onto the boardwalk. Fortunately, that race doesn't go on anymore. And then we have Jones Beach now, very close race to that and very similar. So I can maybe compare some things of the past of the few times I've done Atlantic City to this type of course and that's why I like doing that me versus me and having that you know a little competitive side of things and seeing if I can better my times. So take two right going back to Jones Beach I think a lot of us felt like we needed redemption especially a lot of the local athletes. I'm part of Landshark Endurance you've probably seen the kid out there I mean we literally were all over that course the last two years we're a local tri team we have tons of members and this is just the hometown race. Now let's talk about weather patterns. I typically, especially as a coach athlete, like to build into a four month window into a 70.3 race, you know, out of that base training, if that's the one race you're shooting for. And I must say for my schedule, I typically, you know, do my long bikes outdoors on Saturday mornings. And I was trying to think back over the 16 weeks I don't think we ever had to call the ride due to weather uh, or anything like that. I would say just about every ride was on that Saturday morning and it wasn't anything. We definitely never rode in the rain on those mornings. I mean, there were some windy days down there, but the typical wind that you'll see and that you have to contend with down there, it's just known to be a little more windy down there. There was some magical days and we wished that the race was on those days when there was like no wind down there. The We passed by Zach's Bay where the swim was in the morning on our training days, flat as can be. And, uh, you know, we said, hey, if it's like this, people are just going to have a freaking awesome day out there. But it is what it is. You know, we're dealt the hand we get. Um, we'll talk more about that weather and the lead up in a little bit. So let's take it now into race week. Uh, last year, leading into race week, was a little bit of a different tune. We knew there was this storm forming coming up the coast. We knew it was going to impact somehow. 
And it was one of those calm before the storms weeks. Things were just awesome leading into race day. We had like that Thursday, Friday were just perfect weather at the expo. Like if either one of those days was the race, it was going to be phenomenal. But the, the conditions just deteriorated last year overnight into race day. Unfortunately, they had to cut the swim short. The bike was pretty gnarly with the wind gusts. Uh, you know, I'll put the maybe the wind chart up here of what it was last year, but I remember there was gusts like 35, 40 miles per hour with sustained winds of about 25 miles per hour. But the difference was last year is people were prepared for that. Maybe, you know, I can't want to say prepared, but mentally knowing it was going to be bad. So you were able to pack extra layers. I probably wore the most layers on any of the bikes that I have. I'm pretty good with, you know, decent, you know, cold weather out there. But I had a wind vest on, arm sleeves, you know, anything I could. I had gloves on actually for the bike, uh, my clear lenses, like just kind of prepared for it. And a lot of people backed out of the race last year leading in that morning. They just, they checked in, they saw like, hell no, I'm not doing this today. God bless them. Uh, and again, I'll never, you know, it's... It could be dangerous out there, and we'll get into that also in a little bit as well. But this year was a little different. I think the focus was on uh, this Hurricane Helene that was coming up that hit Florida. There was a lot of chatter in the other groups. You know, they did cancel Augusta 70.3 in Georgia. Uh, that the same weekend, they canceled the swim in Chattanooga. Uh, so there was some other things going on there. And, you know, it was moving towards the inward part of the country. Really, I don't think anybody was expecting anything to really happen up here. They were calling it to be, you know, a little extra wind on Saturday morning. Uh, chance of rain, it would go away, the chance of rain, it would show partly sunny. That precipitation aspect of it really wasn't going to be much of a factor, at least we didn't think it was. And we rolled right in, right? We're rolling right into race week, the expo. Got there on Thursday, checked in. It was like deja vu again, literally. Just being being there again, I can't believe it was one year since the you know we did this race last year. But seeing all the local vendors, seeing Corey Roberts, the race director, his team, top notch. And I'm telling you, you know he's a local race director here. When he puts on an event, you know you're getting you know top class, well treated. Uh, you know as an athlete at these events, and he poured it on as he got this Ironman event. He takes you know he is such a a communication driven person, especially in the Facebook group. He always posts videos. He's always answering questions. He reiterates the most important topics over and over and over again, fix the issues that we had from last year. Uh, you know, the parking issue, which I don't really think was too much of an issue last year, but fixed it this year. Tons of communication out there. Uh, that aspect of it, which we'll talk about race morning went flawless. And uh, it was just great. You know, went in the tent, Merchandise this year actually I think was a little more upgraded. This is actually the shirt they give you at check-in and it's uh, new designs for this year as opposed to you know the ones I have sitting over there which are just a, a plain logo on a plain shirt which I've gotten for the last few years. So the swag was definitely a little better. There was a lot more options. You can have the expensive stuff in the store. There were some cheaper options to buy things. So overall, I think uh, Iron Man as a whole, maybe post-pandemic and everything like that, is is getting that merchandise level and, and some more options in there. So thank you for that. And, uh, you know, we rocked and rolled. I hit an athlete briefing on Thursday, the first one at uh, 3 p.m. So a bunch of local faces. We got the lowdown. And there really wasn't anything new to learn for myself about this course. But it was good to just hear from the race director and, uh, you know, he was excited about everything like that. Really wasn't much to mention about the weather because it was just going to be a, a little wind. And uh, that's about it. You know, he said it was going to be a good swim. It's going to maybe be just a little windy down by the water. And we were going to just rock out and have an awesome race. So Thursday when we left from that, we did go to a bay down the road a little bit, got a little swim in with some friends, and uh, there was some current that night, but I mean, the water was pretty pretty smooth as far as glass for that area, which we always swim, which is just a couple miles down the road, and we were gonna go do the pre-event swim on Friday after we dropped our bikes off. So Friday, we show up, get our bikes racked, head over to the swim start, and uh, when, when I looked out, I told my friend, you know, one of the athletes I coached for this race, our first 70.3, I said, this is the water we were looking for last year. This is perfect. We went out, I swam out to, um, I think the fourth yellow buoy, the first buoy past the turn buoy, came back in about 700 yards or so. And uh, I was like, wow, that, that's a swim I haven't had in a long time at a race. Uh, the other two sprint and Olympic distances I did leading up to this, this year, 
One was actually one of Corey Roberts' races earlier in the year, James Port Sprint, which was an awesome race. Fog shortened the swim on that one. And then we had one out in the Hamptons at Olympic, and that water was gnarly. It was really choppy that morning along the shoreline and probably one of the toughest swims I've done to date for uh, a 1,500-yard swim. So it was just one of those years where I was like, you know, I just want to have a good swim to finish out the year. So practice swim, Friday, uneventful. People are in the water, raving about it. This is going to be great, epic day. Weather wasn't even just, hey, a little bit chance of rain in the morning. Should be done by the time we get out of the water. Just a drizzle, nothing too bad, nothing to really write home about. Temperature was going to be in the 60s. Awesome, pretty good racing weather. And again, just a little windy down by the water, but the way that this bike course plays out, it's basically always going to be windy by transition to some extent on race morning. But as you traverse north onto the bike course, you kind of get protected. You go inland, not Long Island, and that wind and those wind gusts typically tend to die out and it's not much of a problem. So there we go. We get back, getting ready, getting ready for Saturday now. A little side note on where I stand for my goals as an athlete. It was a little different this year. I had a, a pretty good amount. I believe it was 18 coached athletes, including uh, you know single athletes and some relay participants leading into this race. So we were I was very busy with trying to get all them together. So I didn't do a lot of 70.3 races. It was actually the only 70.3 I had on the schedule this year. And leading into it, I had a good training block, decent training, really consistent. And I really didn't put a number or time I think. I, it was the week of thinking about this, hey, let's just, let's not set any pace goals this time. Let's just go out there, put in a really good effort, see where we fall, see where the day lands. But after the practice swim on Friday and how smooth the swim went, I had a pretty decent idea of what my pace would be on this swim course. So I said, let me just sit down Friday night and see where we're at with, uh, you know, goal wise. Uh, I tend to try and shoot for on these uh, more aggressive courses, these faster courses, to try and hit that five hour goal. I've done it a couple times in 70.3s. And I said, you know what, being in the 40 year old age group this year, I said, let me just, I'm up in age group, let me see if I can try and get as close as I can. What would I need to do to get to that five hour mark? So pace plan, shoot it out online here. You know, swimming is the weakest out of the disciplines that I have. So if I was able to, let me, I said, let me, let me try and get a 47 minute swim in. And that would take me also to a five minute transition. That would give me, I was shooting for, to break it down, 230 on the bike, which would be uh, just about what I was able to do last year at Jones Beach. And then a quick two minute transition in T2. And I would have to run a 136 off the bike, which is 720 minute per mile. And that would get me dead even for five hours. And then what I usually do if I have this pacing goal now is I'll actually uh, print them out on little P-Touch labels, put them on the top tube of my bike with little notes on there about time-wise. So when I know coming out of the swim, I'm able to look at my watch and know if I'm plus or minus, transition plus or minus, and also give me something to shoot for. It gives me uh, also pace goals that could pull me forward if I'm you know struggling a little bit. Like if I know I need to hit something and I'm starting to you know suffer a little bit, it, it kind of pulls me towards it. Or if I'm conversely going out way too hot too early in the race, I can say, well, save some of the energy. Let's let's hold back on this. So we'll see as we go on and I break down the swim, bike, and the run how I was able to possibly get this five hours. If I was able to get five hours, it was a kind of bold, aggressive stretch goal for this race. Uh, leading into it just because I haven't, you know, wasn't really focusing on a lot of my specific uh, racing this year as I was helping a lot of athletes this year. Uh, and we'll talk about it as we go on. So Friday night, that was the game plan. I made it, I said, let's see, I got to have something to at least strive for and see where I'm at throughout the day. I just like to know where I'm at, whether, you know, over or whatever it is. So morning of, didn't sleep much, had a good night's sleep the night before, which is always important on Thursday night. Did not sleep a lot, uh, just a lot of thoughts going through my head, just trying to keep checking the weather, kept changing, really nothing stood out much besides, again, some wind down by the water. I, uh, put, I had my aggressive wheel set up on, it was 80 plus millimeter front with a disc rear. I said, you know, let me just, I've had a couple races in storms before, let me just try and get through the hard part down there and then it would be a fast course once we get a few miles in when it's kind of protected from the wind, it was gonna be a crosswind, but with the trees on both sides of the parkway, should be pretty protected and we should be good to go with the bike and the wheel setup. 
I know last year it was very, very windy and going over those three bridges leading out of transition was very gnarly, very windy. Same thing, crosswind, just blowing people all over the place. A lot of people went down on the bikes last year, but it was calling for about half of that wind-wise, so uh, I didn't think it'd be too much of a problem. Kind of leading into it, uh, I kept rolling over and I thought I heard like gusty wind outside, but I, I'm like, it must be maybe just me, you know, a little PTSD from last year still, because it was ramping up overnight last year leading into the race. And uh, I was just, got crazy at the, at the start. Started to drizzle a little bit as we left to head to transition. Started raining a bunch on the way to transition. Started to pick up pretty heavy while we were waiting in the car transition. I said, Maybe this is the rain they were calling for. Maybe it's coming early. Hopefully it'll come and go very quickly. Waited a little bit. It just kept raining. So I said, we got to get ready. We got to get there. We got to put our stuff out. Uh, quickly laid everything out. Had every, that transition. Uh, this is one of those things I don't think too much about now because I've gotten pretty efficient at it. Laid it all out. Grabbed my swim stuff. Started to head down to the water. And uh, soon it was dark out. And once we got to near swim start, kind of looked out into the water. And I said, are you kidding me? The conditions just completely changed again from the day before. Now, it wasn't as bad as last year to swim start because there was like actual like kind of wave rolling, but there was white caps blowing in in a bay, which is which is odd. Uh, it doesn't happen like that, and you could just tell it was churning up. The wind was blowing from the direction out in the bay into shore, so it was just pushing all of the 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 water towards the shoreline and uh, causing it to be pretty crazy. Uh, in the back of my head, I said, you know. There's no way that you know, like they're gonna shorten this swim again. I mean, it wasn't. I don't think it was bad enough where it needed to do that. But I just felt I felt for the athletes that don't get the experience of either getting ocean swims in or swims in bays where there can be a lot of current or some type of adversity in their water. You know, if they only have lakes and pools to swim in, this could be pretty pretty gnarly. And it could also be it's a first timer friendly race, so this may be some people's first time at this distance in a race environment with a lot of athletes, 3,000 plus athletes. So it's going to be a pretty packed swim. And now it's going to be a little rough. I had full faith in the staff there, the rescue team, Jones Beach lifeguards, their equipment they use. I mean, support was out there and they were out there all over the place. They were ready to handle it last year. They were ready to handle it this year. So that in the back of my mind as well said, you know what, regardless, I know that they have some of the best staff out there. So thank you again to all of you that were out there and, you know, helping us get out there. Seated myself, uh, you know, corrals went pretty quick. It was going to take a while to get people in the water. I was in the 40 to 43 group. I was hoping to maybe get around a, a 45 minute swim. But once I saw the conditions, I said, man, that goal that we set, that 47 minutes is going to be pretty close because it's, uh, it's pretty rough out there and that's going to affect some swim times. Rolled in the water in that swim group and went out, headed out there, um, got, you know, just want to get the first few buoys, hit that first red turn uh, to head further out. And I mean, it was choppy. It wasn't overly um, crazy. Uh, I've had worse swims, but it definitely ranked up there in one of the, uh, the hardest swims for 70.3s that I've done. Definitely uh, was tough. So if you had a tough time out there, just know that yeah, you know, it was tough and it's nothing against uh, you or your training. It was just one of those days. That's what's crazy about this sport of triathlon is you're not guaranteed a good day on race day, no matter where the venue is. And, uh, you know, you got to make that decision if you want to continue on or even race in that morning. And that decision relies solely on you. Heading out there though, I just knew getting out and then making that turn, at least we'd have the, uh, the push of the water kind of pushing you back to shore and just mentally knowing like riding each of those uh, waves kind of those, those uh, the chop out there back to shore was going to help out. You know, nothing to really report. Uh, you know, definitely a lot of people backstroking, uh, holding on, getting some, some breaks. You can definitely just tell that it was uh, rocking some people's worlds out there. Looked at my watch a few times out there. So like, all right, I'm sort of in the pace area. It was a little tougher on the way out made up a few seconds pace wise on the way back in kind of was just like, all right, you know, we'll take a look when we get to shore, see where we're at. And that's going to judge the day if we're really far off or maybe close and we can try and push a little bit and make this thing happen today. So 47 minutes was the swim goal for the day. 
got on dry land, looked at my watch right as we're about to time, uh, cross the timing mat, and we were at 46.29, 31 seconds in the bank, headed into transition. I had a really good spot. I had an AWA spot, uh, about two racks from bike exit, uh, one rack in, so I was able to run the length to my bike, basically. Got to my bike, you know, didn't have much extra to put on this year just because I didn't pack much. Uh, I had my calf sleeves on underneath my wetsuit, so they were able to stay on. I didn't have to fight those with the wet legs this year. Did put on uh, some pairs of short, uh, you know, socks, which at this point, I don't know why. I should have just waited till the run and hope that the run was dry. I don't really need the bike with socks on, but I wanted to get them on and done. Uh, got socks on, got the helmet on, and said, all right, let's go. Headed on out. I... Uh, you know, pretty easy transition. Uh, I allotted five minutes for myself. It was a little longer than that last year because I was putting all kinds of layers on and it was just, we knew it was going to be really cold. I didn't have any of that this year, so it is kind of what it was. So I had allotted five minutes for that in transition. Th uh, 3.13 was the time when I crossed the mat. So banked already. This is how I go about my pacing for the day. I knew I had 147 in the bank. If I hit my paces and my T2 as stated, I would be 147 under that goal. Now, we mounted the bike. I knew it was going to be a little windy as soon as we made that right turn out into the wind. And I did not know it was going to be that windy. It took me right back to last year at that point in the course. Albeit this time this year, you know, last year I had a, just a pair of 60 millimeter wheels front and rear. Not, not too bad of a, a big thing, but I had my deeper front wheel which the front wheel on your bike, the deeper it is, actually really becomes unstable in crosswinds. That will send the front wheels in one direction, and if you're not putting a lot enough pressure on the front of your bike, it could send you for a little bit. Believe it or not, I noticed the rear disc doesn't make too much of a difference as far as like blowing you. It's that front wheel, the deep front wheel. So in hindsight, the only thing I would have changed going into this bike course was to put my 60 millimeter front wheel on, and that probably would have made it a lot more stable. But that's the decision I made. There was plenty of other people with wheels just as deep out there, women and men. So I said, hey, that's the decision you made. That's the decision you got. And this is what we are dealt with. So deal with it. Going out those first three bridges, you have to go north, south, north, south. And as you're going to go over them four times, it's gnarly. So yeah, a few miles of like really holding on, crosswind, fighting into the wind to stop. And when you hit those the gusts come, that's when it was uh, really bad. And going on to the bike, it was just one of those, I'm not fighting for age group spots, I'm not fighting to prove anything, so I'm gonna make sure I'm as safe as I can be in those situations. If I can push on certain parts of the course, I will. But between work, family, all that other stuff, I kinda can't afford to go down uh, inadvertently and have a bad crash and be sidelined. And that sucks too, because if you are sidelined, you can't train and you get you know, all the progress you've made. Sometimes you have to make all those steps back. So that's, these are the pros and cons and risk versus reward that you have to weigh for yourself when you want to push in these type of conditions like that out there. So that is what it is. Uh, that's how I approach things. It's just me versus me out there. So when I can, again, control the controllables, something can happen at any moment to anybody and you can go down. But I, you know, let me try my best to keep this thing upright when I can, and I'll push on those parts of the bike when I can. So northbound on the bike course, you're headed up to the turnaround, which is going to be just north of Old Country Road. Decent stretch once you got into the tree-lined area, northern part of it. You know, it was pretty good. You really didn't feel too much of the wind. You were able to push. You were able to find some good spots where you know you can just hammer down. Uh, the average speed was starting to climb up for myself for a 230 bike split. I needed to average 22.4 miles per hour. So those first few miles were just dogging it like with the wind, like just not much anything. So it did take a little while for the average miles per hour to steadily climb up. I was able to gain a little bit of it and just say, well, I got, I'm going to ride the first loop of this course, see where the miles per hour average is for the power I wanted to put out. And then that'll kind of judge how the second loop goes and if it's even feasible to keep pushing at that, uh, you know, at that effort that we were pushing. Back down south, definitely was a little bit faster. There were some spots there where you were you know, definitely in the high 20 mile per hour ranges, 27, 28 miles per hour, cruising, making up spots. Uh, again, one big thing about this bike course, it is three lanes of traffic. But 
he reiterated it, the race director, during the race briefing. And it's just one of those things. The only thing that really bothered me about the whole race is when you're biking, it doesn't matter how big your bike course is. You need to stay to the right. You can't just go into the middle lane of a three-lane highway when you're all by yourself because technically if someone's coming out to pass you, they have to pass you on the left. Now they have to go into all the way into the third lane of traffic to pass you, which shouldn't have to be. If you're just cruising, you're not passing anybody, you have to stay to the right of the right lane. That's just the way it is. That's the way you got to be. That's the courtesy that you need out there. And that's the rules of the race. They were just people all over the place again. And I got it. Going over the bridges, it was kind of like if you were stuck in a lane, you were in the lane because you were going to blow wherever you went if you tried to change lanes. But for the most part, the big parts of the northern part of this bike course, get to the right. There's no reason that you should just be riding side by side, two different lanes with people or just not in the lane that you need to be in. So every time I pass somebody, I'd have to, I'd go back around the right. But again, this year, there were some points where I'm moving at a pretty good clip, catching up to people. I'm not going th two lanes over to pass you. So if you're in the middle lane, just, you know, doing your own thing. Unfortunately, there was people passing people on the right. That's just the name of the game. It happened last year. It's going to happen again until they start enforcing people that they need to stay over there. Whether you have a race official out there giving warnings out for people not obeying that stay to the right rule, whatever it is. But something needs to be done or just reiterated even more somewhere along the lines, especially on this bike course because it is so wide that you need to still stay to the right of the right lane when you're just not passing anybody. Simple as that. So after the first loop, I was literally at just about 22.4 miles per hour. Uh, as soon as you made that little turn, um, headed back towards transition to start the second loop when you got blasted in the face with that crosswind. I know you know what I'm talking about. You were able to take the wind in that one direction for those couple miles. You turned around and you just got blasted in the face. That sucked some of that average speed and uh, right out of everyone's bike splits and that was uh, pretty gnarly. I was on pace, was pushing decent power. My uh, fueling was on point. Everything that I had, I was I was getting into. It was a little delayed starting the fueling just because you got to navigate those bridges. I really wasn't able to take hands off the handlebars and start drinking from bottles, but I was able to catch up. My quads did start to burn a little bit. I think it was just from uh, just the steady pedaling of putting power out. Again, a little stability-wise, my core was sore last night just from kind of stabilizing yourself on the bike in that crosswind. Headed in, I said, all right, so you're doing pretty good. You're on pace to make meet your bike split. Unfortunately, though, on the second loop, there was just a few spots where I had to just sit up at an arrow. I had to kind of stretch a little bit uh, on some of the, the little tiny inclines, the 1%, 2% grays. I got out of the saddle just to stretch my legs a little bit. And I was holding as close as I could. And then as we got to the little turnaround before transition where you, you know, were, had the wind at your back and then you turned and had the wind in your face, uh, you know, I hit the wind at my back, was like motoring, kind of caught up to almost that, uh, that 22.4 miles per hour that I was shooting for, made that turn into the wind and it just zapped the life out of me. And I was like, wow, this is, uh, this is going to be a tough one. So I needed a 230 bike split. All was pretty uh, good out there, besides obviously that wind. I didn't personally see anybody go down. I didn't really know the extent of how many people were gonna, how many people went down until I got on the run, which I'll talk about when I saw a lot of bloody ripped up kits out there on the run, and I said, "Oh, there must have been a lot of people that went down on that bike." But coming in, I needed two thirty. I wound up with a two thirty one forty four bike split at 22.2 miles per hour. So at that point, heading into transition, uh, I knew that I lost a little bit of time into the, the time that I had banked for my goal for the day. Heading into T2, uh, this one I try and take relatively quickly. Uh, I don't really know uh, what what there is to, especially for me, like I don't really use the bathroom much during the, the, the race for 70.3. I'll make sure I go in the water before I get out. That's a big thing, try and get it out of the way there. Tried to go on the bike yesterday, actually. I thought I had to go in the rain, but didn't happen. I've only been able to do that a couple times so far uh, in triathlon. And uh, so I said, well, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna roll with it here. I'm gonna, don't have to go that bad. I'm just gonna hold it, let's go. Let's get out on, the, on the, uh, the run course. Again, my bike rack was right there from bike in. Was able to get off, get my bike there. 
got it on the rack, started changing. The wind blew so much that it actually blew my bike off and it was hanging by one of the CO2 cartridges on the back saddle. It was sideways on the rack. So I had to stop, readjust it, started getting changed again. I went to run off with the stuff in my hand and I saw my bike blow in the air again. And as I was turning, I noticed, started noticing all these other bikes were laying on the floor because they were getting blown off the bike racks. So before I walked out, I said, you know what, just take a second, figure something out. You got to keep your bike safe. It's, it's well worth the extra couple seconds. I turned the bike around, put it on like they did last year, which was on the brake levers. And that was, that helped with the wind overnight. And thankfully it did stay. When I got back, it was like that still. My bike didn't blow off the rack. So that kind of helped, but a couple seconds delayed. I needed this to be quick though, because we were right on the cusp here of the goal. And I needed to hopefully have a two minute transition. Started running right out of transition. So let me get, see what we can do here. Hit my watch as I crossed the timing mat and it was 149 for transition. So I was able to put 11 more seconds in the bank there. Okay, so headed out on the run. I knew it was close. That I probably was within a minute. I think it was actually about 45 seconds in the bank to hit this goal. So it came down to the run, which I like running. I'm pretty good at running for my ability. And I have run some pretty decent 13.1 splits and 70.3s before. And it was a pretty aggressive goal. Want to be one of my better runs that I'm going to need to do off the bike. And it was like, let's see. Let's just settle in first few miles. Don't really look. Don't really, let's just see what today's pace is going to feel like settling in on the run. I don't want to really set goals right away for the first mile. I just want to get into it, get a mile or two in, and then reassess. They were pretty quick miles. I needed to uh, average 720 per mile and shoot for a 136, 13.1 off the bike in order to hit my goal for the day with just a small margin of error in there that I had. But I knew if I at least hit the goal that I set, we should be able to get in under the goal that I needed for the day. Run though, coming out, thankfully it wasn't as wet as last year. Last year was just torrential downpours. The course was flooded, so at least we didn't have that. It actually, for the first mile or two, the sun actually was trying to come out a couple times on the bike, but it just didn't. It, the rain came back and it was just relentless and it was kind of annoying. But on the run, the first mile or two, it almost looked like it was going to break again. I actually got a little warm when I hit the boardwalk and I was like, oh, here we go. The heat's just going to punch us now. It's going to dry up. The sun's going to pop. It's going to be humid and it's going to be a hot run. But it didn't. A little drizzle came back. Overcast came back in. Running out on the run, two loops. You got to head west on the boardwalk. And this was a wind blowing out of the east. So you were going to have the wind at your back, which I knew for the first few miles. And it's actually a little longer heading west on the course because you have to do some out and back. So you kind of have the wind for a little more than half of this run course. And I knew I had the wind at my back on the run. So preparing for this was one of those like, I know though that turnaround is just going to smack me in the face. So I knew I was running a little fast because I did have this wind blowing behind me. It was less effort, less power I was putting into the run. But I did know, unfortunately, though, that turning from uh, heading back uh, eastbound was just going to be tough. Was making up great ground on the run, passing people, feeling good, putting some good miles in. First few miles were sub-7, 650s, uh, 658 for the third, 703 for the fourth, and then we we hit that turnaround. So I knew I was putting a little money in the bank. If I needed 720, I was putting 20 seconds here, 20 seconds here, 15 seconds here, getting close to that minute and a half in the bank, just in case the second half of the run, I started to say like, if I get the first 10K done, at least up to the pace I need, the second 10K can be a couple seconds slower per mile if I start to fade off. But let's try and hit these goals. Things did slow down a little bit when we hit that turnaround into the wind. It was just one of those like, man, it was boom, hit you right in the face. Took the, it felt like you were running with a parachute and I just had to grind. Uh, I knew getting back to transition, you know, electrified uh, run course, uh, you know, seeing so many people out there that I know being a local athlete and coach and the teams, the local teams out there, people I knew from Instagram that I knew were running the race. It was just like every, you know, felt like every 100 or 200 yards you would see somebody that you know would be able to give them a high five in the other direction uh, and just awesome, like awesome atmosphere for myself to be down there on the run. Land Shark Endurance all over the place. We were just high-fiving each other as we went by, picking each other up and 
just making it happen. Once we got back to transition, you run by the water, got to take a look at the swim course again. High tide was coming up a little bit and just looking at it being like, man, again, like this day's happening again. I cannot believe it. Uh, you know, I think it was probably on par with last year because we just weren't expecting it to be like that. Last year, you, we were just expecting the worst and kind of got the worst. This year, we were like, there's no way it's going to be the worst. And it was pretty bad. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. It was uh, a day to remember for sure. Second loop of that run, you can just tell people were grinding. I saw a lot of bloody people out there. That means they went down on the bike. God bless. God bless that you got back up and you were okay to continue on. I'm sure there were some bad accidents out there and a speedy recovery to everybody who went down. Heading into this last 10K, I try and break it down. I know it's like, hey, a 110K, second 10K, maybe break those 10Ks into smaller 5Ks, and then you got that final push of the half marathon. Always break it down so you have these incremental goals throughout. And then made that, that turn, last 10K, we said, you know, like you just got to try and hit the, your pace. Hit your pace for the day. Maybe you can slow up a little bit, but I don't want that to become the trend where I slow up and then feel good and then have to slow up even more. So we're able to hammer out. We hit uh, our goal pace of 720 for every mile except the last 5K because the last 5K was back into the wind for the second time and we lost a few seconds per mile on that. So we were chipping away. But I think I pretty much knew once I made that last turnaround and head into the wind, I said, man, you could fall off to probably about eight minutes per mile right now and probably still sneak in and just get under five hours. So... But I said, you know what, grind as much as you can. you got to get past that lonely part of that turnaround that kind of goes, uh, you know, very narrow area right there. Once you get back to the boardwalk, it's just going to be more condensed. There'll be more spectators and more people cheering. And that's just going to drive you to the finish line and you're going to be able to send this home. Once we were able to kind of smell the finish line, final high fives from some of the athletes on that loop. And we were able to hammer down the last kick of this 13.1 at close to six minutes per mile. I was just so pumped up that this was going to happen. Like, it, even though the day turned south, the day wasn't the day that we were all hoping for weather-wise. I'm kind of getting used to that at this point. And the fact that I was able to kind of hit this aggressive goal that I put on myself last minute for this uh, really pumped me up and uh, really made me, you know, drive hard to the finish line and just, just really send it home. And I had a lot of reasons to put a good performance in out there this year, uh, just for myself and some, you know, family reasons and things like that. And, you know, I'm just happy that I was able to do that for everybody. And, you know, set that, set that standard for yourself where it's, if you do it you versus you, and you know you put the work in, kind of set these audacious goals for yourself and really drive yourself and push yourself to limits that you may not think are, uh, you know, you know, able to be set. Uh, you know, what is your potential? I always ask people, you know, let's unlock that potential. Everybody's potential is different. Some people are going to battle for an age group race after race. Some people are going to fight to always break a seven hour half Ironman or a six hour half Ironman or whatever that goal may be. You may chase that for years or a decade. But when you finally are able to hit that goal and you know you, you put the sacrifice in, the dedication, and you have the discipline, and you're able to do that, you know, nobody can take that away from you. It kind of changes you as a person for a good way. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad of all the people there that were able to finish. Amazing of all the people who attempted to start that race under those conditions. A lot of you didn't finish out there. It was a, it's a tough race, uh, meant to be a good race, meant to be great for first timers, but again, triathlon is humbling, and we learned that again, and it's uh, one of those things, I'm, I'm grateful that we were able to have a triathlon, as opposed to, you know, you see what happened across the country, uh, grateful that we're able to even have these races, grateful for the staff, the volunteers, uh, Ironman, uh, New York State and just being able to shut down an entire parkway for 3,000 crazy people to have fun on a Saturday morning is, is pretty awesome. Um, you know, so take that for what it's worth and be grateful. You know, if this was your first one and only or your 10th or 20th race 
and or maybe you've been shooting for that goal and you put all your eggs in the basket for that time goal or some type of goal this year and you, and you didn't hit it for this race. That's the humbling part of triathlon and that's why I think a lot of us are attracted to it is you can plan, you can do things for months, a year, out to lead into this race and you can only control the controllables. You only have the, the knowledge, the experience, the training that you put in for this race. Uh, that's the only thing that you can really take to the start line. Everything else, you can't control the external stuff that's going to come at you. But like Corey Roberts uh, said during the athlete briefing, is the one thing you can't control on a day like that is your attitude. And if you can approach it with just a good attitude, smile when it hurts, uh, cheer each other up when you see somebody else down, pick each other up during the race, you know, that's really what this sport is about. And you will get out so much of it if you just take the gratitude and your attitude to another level on race day and just be super, super grateful for it all. So again, thank you to all my friends, family, fellow Landshark Endurance, my coached athletes. You all did phenomenal out there. You really, uh, you know, put in the work this year and just got it done on race day. Uh, I really appreciate you putting your faith and trust in me as your coach. And for everybody else out there that tunes into these videos, I really appreciate, uh, you know, and the best thing I get is when I, I see, uh, oh my, I saw your video out there when I'm on the race course, and thanks for that. Uh, to even just one person watches the video and gets something out of these, that's what it's all about. But do me a favor, hit the like button if you like the video. I always try and do some type of race recap on my big events. Uh, just kind of memorialize them onto the internet so I can even look back on them in the future so I can relive the day. Because just like life is as fast as it is and how we've now done this race twice already and tomorrow we're back to work, Monday morning, and this will all be just a distant memory. All you got left is your wristband and some memories of the day. So get after it, stay safe, stay healthy. Don't forget, keep balancing that life one mile at a time and I'll catch you all soon.